Sunrise, sunset, you make the dawn and the sunset dance for joy. It's a reminder that we are not in control of the elements and need someone to take us by the hand. So listen to the exquisite words of the hymn we are about to hear by Samuel Sebastian Wesley. Although Lead Me Lord is included in a number of hymn books, it's best known as a choir anthem, now sung by both cathedral and parish church choirs. Wesley, as the name suggests, was related to the great hymn writer Charles Wesley, his grandfather. Born in 1810, the young Samuel sang in the choir of the Chapel Royal, later gaining a doctorate at Oxford University. He then began a campaign to reform English church music, which had become bland and uninspiring. Wesley was keen to improve musical standards all round and became successively organist of Leeds Parish Church and Hereford, Exeter, Winchester and Gloucester cathedrals. A string of compositions, including Blessed Be the God and Father, Wash Me Throughly, and Thou Wilt Keep Him in Perfect Peace, testify to his achievement. Much of his output is still in the popular music repertoire. joy, giving God the glory. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. St Paul says, Be imitators of God. Love as Christ loved. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Put away all anger and bitterness, all slander and malice. So let us confess our sins to God, who forgives us in Christ. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. 
Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We now go forward with joy and say the Jubilate. If you would like to join with me at home, the words are on the screen. O oh, be joyful in the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is gracious, his steadfast love is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. May Christ, the true, the only light, banish all darkness from our hearts and minds. Psalm 107 reminds us how vulnerable we all are to storms and climate change, and that ultimately we depend on God. Those of us who have been caught in a storm at sea can only have sympathy for those who go down to the sea in ships. But of course storms don't only happen on the water, they can erupt out of nowhere in our personal lives too. What will our reaction be? Job in the first reading thinks about blaming God, who responds by saying that he has it all planned out. His questions make clear that he is in charge of our lives, even when they seem to be going wrong. His love for us remains steadfast in good times and bad, and whatever happens he will have the last word, something for which we should be immensely grateful. Finally, Mark provides an example of Jesus' divine power. He only needs to say, quiet, be still, and the raging storm is immediately replaced by calm sea. But the disciples have already suggested that Jesus does not care for them, that he is about to let them drown. Ultimately, this is a question of faith and identity. The disciples couldn't bring themselves to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and this undermined their whole being. Most of us today still underestimate his power and act like the disciples. Perhaps we need to think again. The psalm appointed for the second Sunday after Trinity is Psalm 107 beginning to read at verse 1. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. 
Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. The first reading is written in the 38th chapter of the book of Job, beginning at the first verse. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we reflect on Psalm 107 and the powerful imagery of the book of Job, the words of our next hymn have a powerful resonance. It's not that we're trying to get the answers to the questions, but as Kate Barclay Wilkinson puts it, we would all benefit from the mind of Christ our Saviour living in us from day to day. Kate Wilkinson wrote her classic hymn in the early years of the 20th century. As the result of her work with girls in West London, the hymn was originally written for children, but it soon reached a much wider public, acquiring a life of its own. Born in Cheshire in 1859, she moved to London after her marriage in 1891. Although May the Mind of Christ My Saviour is her only known hymn, she was a committed Christian throughout her life and was actively involved in Christian outreach. The words are on the screen, so please do join in with this classic if you would like to.
The second reading is written in the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, beginning at verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed are you, God of Israel, for ever and ever. For yours is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty. Everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honour come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might. Yours it is to give power and strength to all. And now we give you thanks, our God, and praise your glorious name. For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. I shouldn't really say this as someone who has always lived on islands, but I have to confess that I'm not a particularly good sailor. I get in and out of small boats quite easily, um, and I'm generally all right on ferries and larger ships as long as I can stay in the fresh air. But in a Force 9 storm, all I want to do is get into the shelter of a harbour as quickly as possible. I don't find beating and tacking in the teeth of a gale very exciting. But I know that even professional seamen can find the sea to be very unfriendly. We've got lots of experience of that here from the window opposite me of Christ walking on the water, commemorating the loss of the redoubtable Captain Charles Hansen, lost overboard from the schooner Result, to the many ships like the Lady Elizabeth that struggled into Stanley after heavy weather, and the crewmen of Jiggers, of course, within the last 20 years who have drowned in the harbour. Some of those incidents probably resulted from the sort of freak storms that often sweep across the shallow inland Sea of Galilee, so graphically described in Mark's account of the near shipwreck of the fishing boat this morning. A great gale arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. The Beaufort scale hadn't been invented back then, but we can infer from this description that the sudden evening storm might well have produced 10 foot waves, such as those recorded in 1992, which caused considerable damage to the town of Tiberias, somewhere maybe between force six and seven. For a shallow draft, low freeboard, clinker built wooden boat, these are dangerous conditions. And it's no surprise to hear that the disciples were literally terrified as the boat took on water. Even today, the treacherous easterly winter winds which sweep down from the Golan Heights are treated with great respect by the sardine fishermen who still work the northeastern coast of this low-lying inland sea. It is low-lying, it literally is 680 feet below normal sea level. 
And make no mistake, these were and are life-threatening conditions. Today we might well expect sailors in this predicament to send up a flare or radio for the lifeboat, options that were simply not available to the disciples. They did the only other thing open to them, turn to the man asleep in the stern, the great teacher who claimed to have a special relationship with God. On the face of it, not a very practical decision, but of course it turned out to be the saving of both them and the boat itself. It's not so much the weather that's important, it's how we react to it. And the Bible has a few helpful hints. The Lord speaks to Job out of the storm in our first reading. Brace yourself like a man, he says, and turn to me. Psalm 107 speaks of merchants on the mighty waters who come to realise the unseen presence of God. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits end. You can almost hear the roar of the sea and the rush of the waves, can't you? Will God help us? Well, where was he when Captain Hansen went overboard? Why does he let tragedies like this happen? These are the great unanswered questions and it's inevitable that we sometimes find it difficult to accept that there is a loving God at all. Well, there's nothing wrong with honest doubt. Three of the most famous 20th century poets, Philip Larkin, John Betjeman and R.S. Thomas asked exactly the same question. But for me, it is the Welsh priest poet Thomas who has his finger on the pulse of our doubt because he believed that God could be described by simple negatives. And that's something we should perhaps think about. In Via Negativo, he puts it this way. Why no? I never thought other than that God is that great absence in our lives, the empty silence within, the place where we go seeking, not in hope to arrive or find. His are the echoes we follow, the footprints he has just left. We put our hands in his side, hoping to find it warm. We look at people and places as though he had looked at them too, but miss the reflection. It's a poignant way of expressing how we all feel at some point in our lives. For some, it may be a more or less permanent state. For others, it may be temporary. But if God does seem to be absent, it doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. Whatever the intensity of the storm around us, or indeed inside us, we can still turn to that unseen presence. And just like the disciples, as the boat appeared to be sinking, say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? As we know from the end of that particular account, the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? As we have been thinking about demonstrating our faith in God in ways both great and small, so also the time comes for, for us to express our faith using the words of the Creed. 
I invite you to join with me at home. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The kingdom of God is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord, and open in us the gates of your kingdom. God of love, how wonderful it is for us all to know that God loves us, no matter our background. Thank you that in the kingdom of God we find radical welcome and inclusion for all, even ourselves. We delight in our Father's love. In your kingdom there will be justice and peace, but we know that this is not the experience of everyone today. Bring your kingdom, Lord. The kingdom of God is justice and peace. God of justice, we pray for people who find themselves caught up in conflict, for those navigating difficult relationships and making hard decisions, for those who have experienced discrimination and unfairness, for those caught up in dangerous situations around the world. We pray for people who find themselves on the margins, for those who feel they don't quite fit in or are being left out, for those who don't want others to know they are struggling, for those who can't access the things we take for granted because of poverty or disability. Break down the barriers. Bring your kingdom, Lord. The kingdom of God is justice and peace. God of peace, we pray for your church, for our parishes and the communities who gather each week, for our brothers and sisters around the world. Strengthen and encourage us, Lord, as we settle into new rhythms of life, we remember those who have suffered and are struggling with the effects of the last few months. We pray for those who are trying to return to a new normality and for those who are caught between the two. Bring your kingdom, Lord. The kingdom of God is justice and peace. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn today not only sets out in very clear terms the foundations of our faith, but encourages us to put it into action as much as we can. The Church's One Foundation was written in the mid-19th century by Samuel Stone, an Anglican vicar, at a time of deep division in the Church. Darwin's research on the origins of man had just been published, and of course it appeared to deny the biblical account of creation. The schisms which rent the Church asunder, quoted in the third verse, 
are a direct reference to this particular controversy. But they could equally well refer to more modern rows over human sexuality and the admission of women priests. Stone wrote a series of 12 hymns on the Articles of the Apostles' Creed and the Church's One Foundation, published in 1866, became deservedly popular. With its emphasis on one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it soon became a standard hymn for special occasions. The words may be traditional, but they are just as applicable to us today. So why don't you join us at home? the Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. scornful wonder men see her sorrow pressed by schisms rent asunder by heresies distressed yet saints their watch are keeping the cry goes up how long and soon the night of weeping shall be the Defend to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those that hate her and fault sons in her pale, against or for or traitor, she ever shall be.
whose son revealed his glory at a wedding in Cana, bring you the blessing of his presence. Amen. May God, whose power turned water into wine, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. Amen. May God, who works miracles in our lives, fill you with his spirit and change you day by day to reflect his glory until that day when you see him face to face. Amen. And the blessing of God the Father and the Son be with you today, wherever you may be, and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. The Lord God Almighty is our Father. He loves us and tenderly cares for us. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Saviour. He has redeemed us and will defend us to the end. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, is among us. He will lead us in God's holy ways. To God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be praise and glory today and forever. Amen. Amen.